Hey everyone, welcome to Marketing 570, Integrated Marketing Communications through Charles Sturt University. So the learning objectives for Chapter 2 are to, let's have a look at the concept of marketing, uh, how marketing communications has evolved. We'll define the concept of Integrated Marketing Communications. We'll, we'll have a look at the reasons for its increasing importance. We'll explore the concept of integration. What does it mean, the different types of integration, how it's implemented, and the typical kinds of barriers towards its implementation. So there are a number of good examples that you can have a look uh, where marketing communications has been uh, integrated. And one of those uh, is the End New Zealand Nothing to Hide campaign. And I'll show you this video uh, and uh, on YouTube. Sunday cleaners and our flesh, fixing holes and sunken fast. And please don't blame me for my lies, just to keep him by my side. And I don't mind if Papa cares, or even if my price you pay includes everything up front do you love a man in uniform okay this ca campaign by in new zealand was set up in order to contain the competitive threat from jetstar uh, it was integrated because it was launched on youtube uh, initially went viral and then a television advertisement was developed uh, in order to uh, complement the uh, the viral launching of the campaign. And then there was an in-flight safety video, uh, which certainly captivated audiences. So it wasn't just one element. The old the old fashioned idea of just having tele television uh, is now uh, dramatically expanded through the use of interactive media such as YouTube and other videos. So the campaign objectives were to maintain market share and help with its retail promotional sales. So to very directly compare Air New Zealand against Jetstar so that uh, New Zealand's airfares were all inclusive uh, and uh, essentially there was a bit of a trust element here saying, look, if you go to a carrier, there might be additional elements that you have to pay. So it was all about leadership and innovation. Uh, and the overall result lifted Air New Zealand's brand profile in offshore markets. And most of it was through unpaid media, such as uh, YouTube. So where we look at uh, integrated marketing communications where it began we knew we knew initially it was about planning and execution but it's also about creating communicating delivering and exchanging offering offerings that have value for customers so this is in relation to the the revised definition of marketing and so what we're left with is that the that marketing is a facilitation skill. It helps facilitate value creation, social impact exchange, uh, and the development of relationships. Now notice also, it's not just about dealing with clients and customers. It's also about helping society at large. And this is a big departure for the AMA uh, definition, uh, uh, earlier definition. When we talk about relationships and value, then we have to ask, well, what do we actually mean by value? And basically, when we talk about value, we, we talk about the customer's perception of all the benefits of a product or service weighed against the cost of acquiring and, consume, and consuming it. 
Now each customer's definition of value will be different. Now when you accumulate uh, individual customers you can reach uh, perhaps a, a market consensus and maybe you might have a market uh, a market performance in index which will accumulate the overall benefits but it's still based on perception it's not based on what actually occurs it's based on a customer's perception and this is an important distinction that uh, we need we need to remember so when we look at benefits under relationships and value we see that there are different kinds of benefits firstly there are functional benefits such as speed uh, there is uh, cost, general performance, quality, those, those kinds of functional aspects. Then there's the experiential aspects of benefits. In other words, what it feels like to use the product, such as uh, as you go through your university degree, what does it feel like as you move through the different subjects and the different core components? Uh, this is something very hard to evaluate. Uh, before you actually use the product. Then there are the psychological aspects, the feelings such as self-esteem or the status that result from owning a particular brand, a product or, or a service. So, we, so in summary we have functional, experiential and psychological benefits. On the other hand, uh, buying a product or service uh, costs money. And when we, we say money is paid for the product or service as well as acquiring information about the product, making the purchase, learning how to use it, maintaining the product, uh, and also disposing of it. So if the benefits exceed the costs, then uh, we weigh up the value and we might compare one product uh, versus another or one service versus another. The next thing in, in marketing comes to relationship marketing. Now, relationship marketing is about creating, maintaining and enhancing long-term relationships. Uh, and this is particularly with, uh, whether it's with consumers, uh, stakeholders, and the overall idea is that in the long term, uh, each party receives mutual benefit. The benefits are for the uh, for the brand are to build loyalty to build trust and in the end to encourage repeat purchases and ultimately make a profit from from these kinds of relationships so remember that marketing in all its context is about facilitating uh, uh, in this respect relationships so when we talk about relationship marketing we're also talking about value co-creation and there are, uh, over recent years, there have been many, many examples where uh, value co-creation uh, has, has become one of the major themes, particularly in the services market. And some of the major reasons are that it provides marketeers with the ability to personalize their communications. Uh, so it means that mass communication can be translated down into the individual level. It's also found with the increasing use of modern technology uh, that it becomes cost effective through using internet uh, and web based technologies. And it's also better from the consumer's point of view because the consumer currently has uh, a better control over the kind of information it gets and the, way, and the kind of products and services which it buys. So let's have a look at uh, one example which is designing your perfect shoe. I've got secrets in my heart. He's got I'm Jody Fox and I'm one of the co-founders of Shoes of Prey. We're a website where you can design your very own perfect shoes. To be honest, I was never really a big shoe lover and it was mainly because I could never find exactly what I wanted. Either the heel was too low or it had a bow in it that I didn't like or it wasn't quite the right colour. So I went travelling and as I was travelling, in the same way you find someone who can make a tailored suit for you, I found someone I could commission my shoe designs with. So I started to create these shoes and as my shoe collection became more extraordinary, my girlfriends asked me to commission shoe designs for them as well. And that's when I kind of realised a lot of women could really enjoy this idea. 
it's a, such a good feeling when you put on a pair of shoes and you get a compliment on them and it's something that you've created yourself. It's just wonderful for me. I, I absolutely love seeing my customers' designs come in and then seeing the finished product and then getting a photo of them, wearing them and looking fantastic. We've had brides, bloggers, celebrities, best friends tell us how much they've enjoyed creating their own shoes with us. And I think it's partly because of how easy the process is. So you come to shoesofprey.com and it all starts with our 3D designer and you get to choose from 12 base designs, whether it's a ballet flat, a killer stiletto heel for that next party you're going to, a pair of Oxfords to pop down the street in, all actually hand drawn for you once you submit your design to us. Now, once you get into the designer, you choose your heel height, anything from a flat to a Glamazonian six inch heel. You can choose your decorations and you can choose from 170 different kinds of materials. So, as you go through and choose your materials, you can then put a different material on a different part of every part of the shoe, and then we'll put that together for you. Everything is tailored to your design. All of our shoes are handmade. This is such a personal process to design your own shoes, and so it was really important for me that that delivered through every part of the process. That's why we have shoes with gorgeous low side walls. We've got the right level of toe spring so that you feel comfortable when you're walking, and it's why the heel has a metal shaft so you'll never be let down. So our shoes are all shipped free of charge, but I do know what it's like to shop online, which is why we have a pretty awesome returns policy. You can return your shoes to us unworn within 365 days, or within that 365 days, you can have a remake of your shoes, which includes a redesign, because I'm pretty confident that I can make you your perfect shoe. Now, if you're in the heart of Sydney, you could also come by our first store that we've opened in David Jones on Elizabeth Street, and that'll give you the chance to touch the leathers, try some of the shoes on, and talk to some of our shoe design experts. And it's really just such a great way to experience designing your own shoes. I've genuinely had such an amazing experience with Shoes of Prey. I can say to you that I really have found my dream job. It's been the most gorgeous experience to share that with friends, family and strangers who are also loving designing their own shoes. And it's my hope that when you go onto shoesofprey.com that you see why this experience has been so exciting. So you can see there's the similar kind of system as by Shoes of Prey as Dell Computer. So it's a configuration system. So essentially you, you get to design your own shoe. Uh, you can choose the designs, etc. Uh, but it's also linked in with its retail store. So uh, if you don't want to buy online and you want to see what the actual physical fit is, you also have the option of going into a retail store uh, as well. Now, another example of value co-creation relates to uh, one of the major news integrators uh, called Flipboard, and I'll show you this video now.
So with Flipboard, you can see that the old idea of the magazine or the newspaper is completely thrown on its head. Uh, with Flipboard, you have the, the ability to integrate news from anywhere, from any source in the world. And then to share that uh, those news sources with um, people who may find it interesting, with your friends, with your relatives, with uh, other people out, out there. And they can also follow you, right, and follow the kind of articles which uh, which you're you're interested in. So whether it's uh, uh, any any kind of topic, so this personalization of the integration of news is uh, has uh, uh, dramatically changed the face of of information sharing uh, over the last uh, few years. So when we have a look at the factors which are driving relationship marketing. We see that customers are becoming much more demanding. They want information, they want their products, they want their services uh, um, much more conveniently and they want them now. And they want to be they want more control over the way that they um, collect information. They don't want to be marketed to, they want to be involved uh, in the process in many of these products or services. So they're looking for a desire for superior value uh, and we're lucky uh, with the advances in information technology that consumers now have the ability to search online, to search through YouTube, through Instagram, through f facilities such as uh, Flipboard, etc., uh, to find out what it is that they want. And also, there are now an increasing range of flexible manufacturing processes and the rising incidence of 3D printing, which is making manufacturing and the development of prototypes much, much more easy. So how does the uh, concept of marketing get translated into practice? And that's through the marketing mix. So the implementation of marketing strategies occur through the marketing mix. And the traditional approach was I uh, design a product or a service. I identify the price which consumers are willing to pay. I work out the distribution strategies, the channels through which I think that I can sell this particular product or service, and then I figure out how to promote it, how to communicate uh, to the audience. However, uh, over recent years, there are a number of additional aspects which need to be taken into account, and that is uh, the people, the actors who are involved in the, in the process, whether it's the stakeholders, um, which influence the decision-making process. They're not actually, not actually the customers, but there are also other, other influences on the decision, decision matrix. There are the processes involved to make sure that I develop a system which, uh, which uh, minimizes the cost of each process and maximizes the value cre created. And then there's the physical evidence. Uh, particularly in a service environment, this is a little bit more difficult and this might, for example, revolve around the brand logo, uh, the signs and the symbols uh, and the technology, the web, the web presence, etc., which are involved in product design. So now we have um, seven pieces of, uh, of marketing matrix uh, to take uh, this in, into account in, in the implementation of marketing strategies. So we've seen integrated marketing communications evolved uh, from the 1960s where we had a nuclear family watching television. Uh, even in Australia, the first television was introduced uh, uh, into Melbourne in 1956. Uh, and that has evolved to internet empowered individuals with greater disposable income and a greater variety in their living arrangements. So we have uh, in Australia today, up to a quarter of a, a quarter of households, which are which are single single individual households, uh, compared with the old idea of the nuclear family in the 1960s, and so we've seen lots of changes in demographics, in lifestyles, in media use, and buying and shop and shopping patterns. And marketers have to take uh, these changes into account when developing their marketing strategies. So we've seen also an, an, an evolution of um, agencies, advertising and other agencies, 
in respect to integrated marketing communications. So previously companies relied on advertising agencies for guidance. So uh, um, during 20 years ago or more, 15, even, even 10 years ago, television advertising for, for the major brands was the dominant uh, provider uh, of, uh, of, of media. And it was easier for the advertising agencies to communicate uh, with their audiences um, from a process perspective, from an integration perspective, uh, than to use other marketing communication uh, channels. But this, uh, this idea is now uh, evaporated and, and additional marketing communications channels have been added uh, now as integral components uh, of communicating with customers. So a lot of marketeers built barriers around promotional functions. Uh, they created silos. Uh, and uh, one of the things uh, that we noted uh, under previous periods that, that it was tended to be a little bit easier just to focus on television and radio advertising rather than doing direct ma direct marketing or public relations or sales promotion. And so, and so that's why you had these communication elements added on as an auxiliary or, or an afterthought. And often there used to be separate sub-agencies uh, where skills were employed, not in the main advertising agency, but in their subsidiaries. So now there's an overwhelming need to integrate all these elements of the communication mix and that's why the concept of uh, IMC um, now uh, has evolved to try and present a consistent image across a range of marketing mix elements. So we had the agency evolution. There are a lot of factors which contributed to the rise of integrated marketing communication. There's been a, a dramatic uh, improvement in the professionalism of sales promotion, direct marketing and PR over the last 10 years. Uh, and there's been a, a great deal of competition between advertising agencies and these specialist communication service providers. And also clients have, have significantly increased their ex expectations that agencies need to offer a broader range of services. And so marketers are becoming smarter, more sophisticated, and are being able to redefine their activities in a more strategic and coordinated manner. So previously, under marketing communications, we had all these different elements, of point of purchase, publicity, sales promotion, packaging, direct response. The whole uh, system was fragmented run by separate organizations without any overall integration from a brand or a product or service uh, perspective. Now uh, this is being replaced by a coordinated integrated marketing communications approach when there's one consistent uh, message across all for all forms of media. So we can have a look at, for example, the, the coordinated approach in relation to Mont Blanc, where, I mean, this is a premium brand uh, and it's projected, its image and brand image is projected through both advertising and the retail store distribution. Uh, however, it's the image projection is consistent, whether it's uh, uh, radio advertising, television, whether it's print, uh, the, the premium image is presented. Uh, and even in relation to retail store distribution, the uh, Mount Blanc uh, use um, boutique jewellery stores and the like. They wouldn't be going to Target uh, or Woolworths or some of the stores which don't represent the, the kind of image which they want to project. So when we look at what we mean by uh, integrated marketing communications, first thing we notice is a, it's a strategic business process. So it's designed to influence the overall profitability, growth and direction of the organization. So therefore it's strategic. So it involves planning, developing, executing and evaluating uh, and measuring uh, brand communications over time with consumers. Notice also it includes customers, prospects, employees, associates and other stakeholders. And so we're looking at generating both short-term 
uh, and long to, long term uh, shareholder shareholder value. Now this is not as easy as it sounds because sometimes there uh, and quite often there can be a conflict between short term goals uh, and long term goals, uh, and particularly in relation to public companies, there is. Uh, this continuing need to satisfy shareholder demands for dividend yields, etc., uh, and that may sometimes conflict with the longer term goals. For example, it may be uh, in the company's interest to uh, develop a long term strategic approach to a particular product or service. Uh, but uh, because of the competition, uh, if they if they develop those products now, it'll require research and development expending, uh, and that will lower the profitability of the firm in the short term, uh, and that that may upset the uh, the, sh the shareholders. So there's this constant balance between sh between short term uh, and long term uh, results. So when we have a look at um, how integrated marketing technology uh, is used. There's a note of caution to think about, right? It's, so um, integrated marketing communications, it's a powerful communications technology. But the technology itself is amoral. In, that, in other words, it, it lacks a moral sense. It's not concerned with right or wrong uh, of, uh, of anything. And all of all of uh, the students who study uh, integrated marketing communications, it's up to uh, you uh, and others who learn this kind of technology how you're going to use it, whether you use it for the benefit of the stakeholders and and society. And there may be a conflict between how a technology is used for your customers uh, versus the benefit the benefits or cost in relation to society. And it's a moral question, and all marketing communications practitioners must face as they implement this technology. Let's just have a little uh, example and look at uh, Ben Johnson, the, fam the famous uh, athlete. Nobody knows performance enhancement <laughs> like Ben Johnson. That's why he's endorsing Sportsbet's new unfairly fast Android app. Get on it! Get on it. So think about this ad for a minute. Here we have Ben Johnson advertising uh, sports betting. Uh, think about Ben Johnson. He was disqualified from receiving Olympic gold medals due to uh, drug uh, uh, cheating uh, and here a company is using Ben Johnson uh, to promote pr promote their particular products uh, whether this is a good thing or not uh, different people will, ha will have different points of view but I think it can be argued that it's not a good message that a company promotes a drug cheat to uh, promote its uh, products or, or services so when we have a look at a contemporary perspective of IMC, we realize that it's an ongoing strategic business process. Uh, it affects multiple uh, relevant audiences and there's an increasing demand for accountability and measurement of the outcomes. Just the idea of measuring the increase in awareness uh, is no longer satisfactory. Uh, to to a great many brands, they want to know what is the return on investment. If I spend a million dollars on a form of integrated marketing communications, what is the re what is the return that I receive? And so that's why the returns uh, uh, and the return on investment is becoming an increasingly important measurement uh, tool in the arsenal of uh, brand managers. So if we look at the reasons for the growing importance of IMC, we, we can see this trend from moving just from media advertising to multiple forms of communication, whether we're having word of mouth through Facebook, through blogs, uh, through Twitter, through um, 
uh, Instagram, etc. We're moving from a mass media approach to specialized media. And we can do this because of the, the tremendous advances in information technology over the years. So we're moving from a manufacturer dominance to a retailer dominance. So this is why in the retail area, the, the, the non-manufacturer brands are taking an increasing share uh, of, of the marketplace. And we're moving from a general focus to a database focus where we can target specific, specific groups of customers or even specific customers themselves. And we're looking for greater agency accountability. We want to be able to measure the return on investment. Uh, and obviously in previous years we had limited internet availability and now there's widespread availability and that provides a, a much greater capacity of consumers to, in, to interact in the information processing uh, regime. So previously we had the marketeer uh, having control over information. Uh, and now we have the consumer uh, increasing their demands for time, timely information as well as entertainment. So one example of um, the changes in uh, integrated marketing communications, uh, the ability to target uh, and involve people uh, interactively in the process. And here, for example, we look at the Singaporean Red Cross. It's also, this particular program has also been, also been carried out in the United States uh, and elsewhere. So, so the aim was a plea for blood donations. Uh, and previously, you would have specific community service announcements uh, with general announcements. And, and then, uh, so you can take kind of a blue ocean approach uh, and the Singaporean uh, Red Cross drew on the conventions of dating. So in other words, encouraging uh, people to find their perfect match uh, at blood do donation events. So here we have the, the multiple um, uh, communication channels. So we have uh, advertisements appearing, uh, building up awareness, uh, linking, linking it to uh, dating uh, and then um, matching it with, uh, with specific kinds of events. So we're talking about many different kinds of channels being used in the communication process, including social media, publicity uh, and events. So when we talk about the integration of, IMS, of IMC, so, and we think about the definition where integration is, it's a management process that can be both functional task uh, that can be both a functional task of coordination as well as a strategic. So we have both strategic and, and task oriented. And you see there's, there, there have been a, an, uh, a great many articles written over the years covering um, the types of integration. Whether, and some, some researchers saw us at a continuum, uh, some kind of researchers focused on different types of consistency, uh, and uh, uh, early uh, 1996, um, uh, Petrosen focused on different kinds of uh, integration, such as executional and planning. So gradually you've seen this interpretation of integration changing uh, over the years. So when we look at uh, integration from a continuum perspective. We see at one end of the continuum audiences receive mixed or incorrect messages. And so we call this a dysfunctional approach. So at the other end, the combined effect of all messages, messages adds value, or we call this a synergistic approach. Uh, and there are a wide range of um, uh, touch points between dysfunction uh, and synergy. And organizations now need to make sure that their messages are consistent across all channels uh, leading towards the communication outcomes. So we can see that uh, we have different uh, types of integration can be message based where it's tactical, where we're focusing on a specific message for a specific type of, uh, of event or a campaign or strategic where we're trying to change the overall direction of the organization or to, in, or to increase the growth. So when we talk about uh, message integration, um, 
we're talking about both visual uh, and verbal uh, consistency, such as having a consistency between the theme of the message, the consistency, the color, uh, the common tones, and the, and the logo, all presenting the same kind of image. Strategic inter integration. It's all about, for example, we may have a number of different brands, uh, but perhaps we share the budget. We have a coordination between the different brands. There, there may be a common set of objectives between different channels and different brands, depending on the, on the, the, the overall differences between those brands. They need to uh, fit in with an overall corporate uh, mission, but they require strong leadership. Particularly integrated marketing communications can't succeed without the strong cooperation of the chief executive officer. And also uh, it may require the integration and, uh, and the development of cross-functional teams and the de development of, uh, and consistency of multiple audiences and the use of multiple uh, communication disciplines. So finally, we get to looking at integration with, uh, within the organization. Uh, and the argument here is about integrating the whole, whole organization, whether that's from the first level tactical coordination, the second level redefining the scope of marketing communications, the third level, the application of information technology to be consistent across the organization, and the fourth level is the integration with financial and, and uh, strategic uh, measures to make sure that we can measure uh, what the outcomes are of these communication objectives. So the overall principles of IMC integration are now firstly that all customer touch points impact the brand and brand equity, not just advertising and promotional messages. So, so the idea of just looking at advertising and promotion uh, is a little bit old fashioned and we, so we need to include, so, particularly these days, social media. The second principle is interactive two-way communication. It's not just about one-way mass media messages. It's uh, trying to involve the customer in the communication process to increase engagement. And then we see the idea that we see transactions as just a relationship building block. So to ensure that each transaction strengthens, uh, and we know that uh, a transaction can either strengthen or weaken a customer brand relationship. And so the overall strategy should be designed to, inc to strengthen the, the customer brand relationship. And then uh, another major objective is to retain and grow customers. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, the ability to grow and retain is, is even more important than just acquiring new customers. And the fifth idea is to realize that IMC is an ongoing interactive process. It's not a stop start uh, and it's about continuous building of those brand relationships with customers and other stakeholders in the organization. When we look about IMC practices, we need to make sure that our communications and strategies are customer focused. Uh, and sometimes we need to be careful that we uh, include an outside in thinking. In other, in other words, we really want to know what the customer thinks about our communication strategy. So we'll, we should be conducting as much research as possible to make sure that we're aligned with the customer's needs also needs to be cross-functional planning and monitoring of, of all brand messages. We need to uh, manage customer expectations. It's not about managing customers, it's about managing customer expectations. And we need to make sure that the communication messages are strategically consistent and the brand positioning is integrated into all brand messages. Uh, and that marketing communications planning is based on prioritized strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And second last, we need to ensure that our segmenting and our targeting of, of individual customers uh, are database driven uh, and, that, and that we have an overall approach and that we're collecting good information through our customer relationship management systems. 
And finally, our relationships, metrics and other financial measures are used to evaluate the IMC programs. And this is becoming increasingly important, as I said earlier, looking at return on investment. Just remember that there are a lot of barriers to the implementation of IMC. There are silos. So you might have someone who's a specialist in television advertising who really is not interested in sales promotion uh, or in direct selling. There are turf battles so that the advertising uh, executive uh, wants to uh, be prioritized uh, over, the, uh, over the sales executive. There's also a lack of expertise. It's very hard to be an expert in everything these days. And so it's important to be able to bring in people who understand each aspect of the process and can coordinate the overall area. Also, the, the, the um, uh, operation of multiple agencies can be a problem because different agencies have different kinds of philosophies, uh, different objectives, different agendas, and the ability of the brand to coordinate all these agencies becomes fairly important. The absence of measurement tools is a, is a critical aspect. Now, sometimes we can be overwhelmed. And I think, for example, in Google, uh, I think they may have developed over 200 uh, measurement tools. And I think that having too many measurement tools can also be as problematic as not having enough. And increasingly, we know that the return on investment is becoming uh, an important measure of today. But this is not so easy to measure in many, many circumstances. And also the lack of database development, not knowing who your customers are. And this is uh, of paramount importance in the business to business environment. So we know that there are, there are a multitude of uh, IMC audience contact tools from broadcast media to print to public relations to internet to interactive. And we saw uh, in chapter one, one of the earlier slides show that now digital communication represents nearly 50% uh, of, of overall um, uh, uh, audience, audience contact whether it's uh, direct marketing or sales promotion or word of mouth, all of these things can be used in different ways to achieve the results that you, you want to achieve with any brand communications program. So in summary, overall, uh, we need to understand the role and the function of marketing in an, or in an organization. And we realize that marketing is a facilitation process. It, it, uh, Marketing activities uh, involve the combining of the four control elements or the, or the seven controllable elements of the marketing mix into a comprehensive program. So there's been a tremendous increase uh, in the recognition of IMC uh, amongst uh, companies during the last five to five to ten years uh, and the efficient coordination uh, of these IMC activities. Uh, Means, a, means an overall lower cost structure. So there are uh, many, many factors which underlie the move towards IMC. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are at least 12 different kinds of tools which we've spoken about earlier, uh, uh, which, which can be integrated to, to help in the development of a communications program. So the marketeer has to decide which kind of tools are relevant to which consumers in the market segment to which they're interested in uh, in order to achieve the organization's objectives thanks again for listening uh, and next uh, the next lecture will be focused on, ch on chapter three bye for now